The problem of toxic masculinity is much bigger than the contemporary expressions of Christianity in the West mainstream, or rather, the mistreatment of women and the dehumanization of men and others is a feature of all human cultures fraught with sin, but of course the church is called to be salt and light, so how can we foster a non-toxic masculinity? This is the Embodied Faith Podcast with Jeff and Sid Holsklaw, where we are exploring a neuroscience-informed spiritual formation produced as always by Grassroots Christianity, which is growing faith for every day. Today we have the guest, uh, Zach, Zachary uh, Wagner. I always get confused when I come across a Wagner because I always want to be like German and be like, is it Wagner? But I know like we're all yeah, Americans, Wagner. so yeah, it's, yeah, just, yeah. it's Wagner, right? So sure. it, <laughs> Wagner, Midwest, yeah, yeah, well, we Midwest, uh, yeah, so you got Zach the Midwest Wagner A in there, which I appreciate. A writer, researcher, and a minister. He serves as the editorial director for the Center for Pastor Theologians. And we're talking today about his new book, Non-Toxic Masculinity, Recovering Healthy Male Sexuality. Thanks for being on with us today. Yeah, delighted to be here. So Thanks for having me. Why don't we uh, just jump in with uh, what is toxic masculinity? We always got to start with definitions. A lot of people have different things. This is a real thing. It's yeah. not a real thing. We talk about it too much. We don't talk about it enough. What is toxic masculinity? Yeah, there's, I think, a lot of different ways you could define it. And of course, you can go Oxford English Dictionary on it and you'll find some sort of definition having to do with the cultural values or behaviors or uh, stereotypes associated with masculinity that either encourage or result in men being macho or overly aggressive or emotionally repressed or violent or any of the bad things um, you might associate with extreme expressions mm -hmm. of quote unquote masculinity is kind of it, it 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 really just kind of means bad masculinity in the common in the common parlance, which uh, of course raises all sorts of other questions. Um, I in my book take a little bit more of a theological anthropological spin to defining the term, and what I say is toxic masculinity is a way of living out masculinity that dehumanizes self. Or de and or dehumanizes others. Part of what I'm doing there is I'm taking a a theology of sin and a theological anthropology uh, that understands sin as a type of dehumanization. You are falling short is a language we often associate with sin of uh, your own calling as a human being created in the image of God, or failing to treat, think, or uh, have a disposition towards others that treats them as fully mm -hmm. human created in the image of God. Um, and uh, the other thing I'll say about the definition is that I am playing on that idea of toxic, which we might have associations with poison or sickness or illness or something that can even kill you. Um, and uh, that's kind of the connection that I'm making with dehumanization. A toxic masculinity mm -hmm. is a subhuman masculinity. Um, so I'll stop. That's, that's how I define it broadly. Yeah. Um, I'm well, sure there's lots of so I like the word go from there. toxic that you zero in on and people use that all the time and it, and it could mean two things, right? So some things are just naturally poisonous. If you take them, they're toxic, yep. uh, and they will do detriment, uh, kind of in at any level if you ingest them or take, you know, like radiation or whatever, right? Or, well, actually radiation might not be one. Um, but, um, and so mm -hmm. I think on some, so if we go outside of um, just like the Christian circle, because you're talking about theological anthropology, which I'm a huge fan of, of course sure. we are on the show, like this, what embodied faith is, is how does it, be, how does becoming human also become theological, right? So, but outside of that, sometimes um, it, it kind of in the more progressive or further left discourse or thoughts of these things, any kind of masculinity is kind of de facto deemed to be toxic. Any kind of expression of particular male embodiment can be or is seen to be toxic. So we don't have to go down that road, but I just want to kind of put a pin on that. Um, but I think the road or the, the the view we're in is something like, well, too much of something could be toxic, whereas the right amount is actually could be healthy to you or something like. Now, of course, I'm not a nutritionist. Mm. I 
you know, Sid probably has like 10 examples of what toxic things, um, at too much of the dose. I, so I don't have anything practice. Sid, do you have a, w w what is toxic if you take too much of it, but it's good for you if you, you know. Well, I mean, even just really simply, if you drink way too much water, okay. that can be toxic the because yeah. then it messes with your sodium levels. So, you know, even anything that's really good for you inherently, too much of or abused, yeah, when of you course, take out, becomes when toxic. You have too much vitamin B, I mean, your pee turns a little orange, right? Anyhow, so so we're 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 in that kind right. of uh, arena. I would assume that we don't by on um, by definition we don't think masculine embodiment is bad um, or inherently evil, uh, right? Yeah, certainly not. Certainly not. That would not that would not be that would not be a Christian in my view. That would not be a Christian view. Of well, I just wanted to humanness. say that because I know we have listeners from all different spectrums who are listening. You know, and, and these words or these things, you yep. know, can become very contentious. And so I just want to say, you know, we're... yeah, I was almost yeah, going to ask you to define what you mean by what it means to be human. But I was like, oh, that's a rabbit <laughs> yeah, trail. We could go long... on for a very long time. <laughs> but you just kept using dehumanizing what it means mm -hmm. to, you know, to treat us human. I'm like, let's well, define yeah, let's that. But about we don't dehumanization, need to do that completely. Uh, and just I sort think of... Sid and for Zach, you guys could talk about sure. this. Um, like, well, what is it about toxic masculinity that dehumanizes women? But also men, um, ourselves. Like how how does that dehumanization process function within this conversation? I'll start with Zach, but I think Sid, you have a lot of experience just in your coaching and spiritual direction of some of that too. Mm. Yeah, I'd love to hear some of that as well. I in my book, it focused largely on questions having to do with sexuality, relationship, eroticism, marriage, things like that. And um I think there has been, certainly since the Me Too movement, and then also within the church, the Church Too movement and various scandals and denominational uh, cover-ups and this sort of thing, there's a conversation having to do with masculinity and men um, as it relates to sexuality. So that's the angle that my book is coming through a lot. And one of the points I was trying to make is when you think about sexual abuse or quote unquote misconduct or even compulsive sexual behavior or uh, the, the term sexual addiction is controversial in various circles. Uh, uh, but um, certainly for me as a kind of non-psychologist, non-therapist, I think it's uh, I feel kind of in my lane comfortable uh, describing certain sexual behaviors as addictive. I think there is a tendency to say and to see very kind of intuitively that there are ways that men can relate to women or to others sexually that dehumanizes them. This is the it's objectifying to women or you look at women as sex objects or you treat women like pieces of meat. Um, all of those things, just even in the language that I was using, we have a, a way of speaking about attitudes and ways of treating others that dehumanize them. Uh, if you're looking at someone as meat, you're not treating them as a person, mm -hmm. you're treating them as an object. Um, and uh, that has all range of applications um, just in terms of that way of thinking about things, whether it be through use of pornography or lustful fantasy or uh, having a sexual relationship with someone that you have no intent of maintaining a loving commitment to any number of things, of course. Um, uh, and, but I think it's sometimes less appreciated is the way that these same types of things are not merely dehumanizing to the person who is the object of the sexual fantasy or assault or what or, or abuse or whatever the case may be. I argue that uh, if this is, you know, we're assuming a, a man to woman kind of situation here, I argue that those ways of acting out and thinking about others are also a way of dehumanizing self. And if you are uh, a man, dehumanizing yourself as a man. And what I mean by that is that a lot of times I think in the Christian subculture, there can, we 
have adopted this narrative around masculinity that is men only think of one thing as it relates to relationships or only prioritize one thing and uh, mm-hmm. that is sex. So we have this vision of male embodiment that is hypersexual, hypererotic, and we almost conceive of what it means to be man is to have this hypererotic lens through which one views the world. So a way this plays out is that if there is some sort of untoward relationship, say in a Christian context between a man and a woman or uh, you know a pastor and a congregant, something like that, a lot of people um, just knee-jerk will find themselves raising questions like, okay, well, was she mm-hmm. quote unquote asking for it? Or what was she wearing at the time? Or what type of signals was she sending? And of course, that puts all the responsibility on the woman. And implicit in that way of talking about these types of situations is this idea that the man is somehow less responsible or less able to treat others, treat a woman in a dignified human way. And there's dehumanization, different types of dehumanization going on on both sides of that equation. This is not like, oh, men are normal and respected, uh, noble and respected and kind of fully human um, participants in in this scenario and uh, treated with absolute dignity and respect, and women are uh, demeaned uh, and treated as less than human. I, of course, the the latter is the case, but it is also the case that this is a subhuman, sub-Christian, I would argue, vision of what it means to be a man. Yeah, what what, uh, sort of comes forward for me as you're talking about that second half of things of how it's dehumanizing the man is it's almost like there's this implicit message of you're just an animal. Correct. And you have these instincts and these impulses and, um, you know, and then it gets sort of put on women to control the impulses of the, of the yes. animals that they live with and around. Um, and so that is, you know, I, I, I hear that and I, I resonate with that, you know, and I think that, you know, I was just noticing that like, my skin was crawling when you were having that conversation about like, what was she wearing and was she asking for it and what was she doing? And I was just like, the rage is building in me as I hear you talking about that. And it's just like, yes. you know, to, to have that sense of somehow um, the victim is responsible for the perpetrator, right? It's just sort of a, I mean, and I think we can all name that that's not the reality of how it is, mm-hmm. but that is, that is sometimes the knee jerk response. Yeah. Um, for me, I think, I think in the work that I have done with people, like even outside of the sexual dynamic, um, to me, I think that the thing that feels like it's underneath all of this is a sense of like the freedom to choose and agency. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that somehow toxic max- masculinity takes away the power of choosing from both men and women. Mm. Um, because it leaves, it leaves women in the sense of like, um, you know, men believe that I'm sort of a, I'm a prop on the stage for their story. Um, and it's sort of, I'm an accessory to the life of a man. Um, and not, not in a conscious way, but you know, that, that, you know, and then, and then we see the flip side of that, of the backlash against that is now, especially in popular culture, there's this sort of general denigration of men in general. And sort of like, mm. okay, we're done with that. We don't want any more of that. Like, we're not going to let you behave that way anymore. Um, and then it becomes this, like, just because you're in the body of a man, you are already my enemy, right? Or you are already against me. Mm. And I know we've had those conversations with our sons who are 18 and 20 of that sense of like, you know, um, in my generation, at my age, I am automatically the enemy, Right. It's like that sort of like that, that, that generation is sort of saying like, you know, um, men are, you, you, we are to be suspicious of men even before they have given us a reason to be suspicious of them. Mm-hmm. It's sort of the sense that our boys are, are, you know, they see well, that's that where it's in kind sort of, of pop culture. Split, social I, think. Media. I just want to like, note this for everybody. This works. I feel like it's split between the church and then the culture broader is that, uh, a, a, yeah. and again, we're, the culture larger would be like the media culture and kind of the popular representation. So I don't know so much about like the deep South or something like that. 
Sure. But like, so the church, uh, men, especially conservative churches or evangelical churches, men are given the benefit of the doubt. Um, but then our kids being raised in this culture uh, with the Me Too movement, you know, happening right when they're, you know, teenagers, they were internalizing the broader, like, I am a suspect wherever I go all the time. And so, you know, I think, uh, yeah. and this is partly why I think this is such a, a conversation is, well, how do we raise boys, but then also women, like in this context where it's like, we don't, mm. both sides are kind of bad. We don't want to automatically assume that boys will be boys. They should be excused of their behavior when it's bad. We should always assume the best intentions and then blame the women for everything. And then we don't want the reverse too. Uh, which is, you know, a male body is inherently dangerous right. and threatening to every woman that's nearby. Um, they yes. should be excluded um, from speaking and participating uh, because of their danger. Uh, and so how do we kind of, yeah, go, go ahead. That, so, yeah, well, that's where I feel like that underneath is that whole fundamental, like, you know, in, I think a lot of what it means to be human is to have the freedom to be able to choose. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't, no other species has that. Um, we're created in God's image in that way. And any time that we are bound by reactions or we are forced or coerced, um, we don't have the same kind of freedom that like, you know, that that freedom of of I can freely choose. I can freely choose to receive the God, the love that God has given to me. I can freely choose to love the people in my life. And when we're bound up and held captive by these conditioned reactions and these, you know, these senses of what it means to be masculine and feminine or these dynamics at play or we're reacting against those dynamics, we have lost some freedom. I don't know if that's making any sense. I'm just thinking on the fly, but that seems to me like what's underneath it all is that loss of freedom to choose. So you're both looking at me like, nope, that's not it, which no, is that's fine. Not, no, I me. don't disagree. I'm I'm thinking, and you guys would know more about this than I would perhaps, but I'm just thinking of kind of you know, it's sometimes it's called reptile brain versus, you know, higher brain function type stuff. Um, and uh, the question that I had listening to you, just continuing from that, is how to think about our, and, and it does relate to this conversation ar ar around masculinity. How, how do we relate our instinctual urges, um, which would include Things like protecting oneself or one's group or one's family, as well as, um, you know, sexual urges to bond and to reproduce and things like that. And I think what so often happened with male identity is we like shrink. And this, this is the, uh, something I say in the book, we shrink male identity around the sexual and the erotic and mm -hmm. the erotic, um, where we kind of dehumanize by reducing them to sexual animals as uh as you said earlier sit and um then we also hypersexualize women by reducing them to sexual objects they become objects for the sexual fulfillment of men or for the sexual utility of reproduction or something like that and um yeah i just think all of it all of our humanity, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud too, is included in our being created in the image of God, not merely our kind of higher moral ethical functions, but also our em embodied urges and desires. Like so many of the things, like the deep um, preservation of the species type desires, I think are manifested in ways that are really interesting and design and and divine and um you know in the screw tape letters one of the things that wormwood talks about is uh how the demons find humans so disgusting because they're this hybrid of spirit and animal hmm. um and uh that i think from a christian perspective is really incredible and miraculous and beautiful is yeah. that humans are are not mere animals, but we are indeed animals imbued with this divine um, freedom. I think, as as you as you say, Sid, I think th that comes together in a really profound way. So I think it, where these scripts of masculinity and even of femininity can go wrong 
is when that uh, beautiful, incredible divinity of what it means to be human, the kind of union of flesh with uh, spirit or soul um, is diminished. And uh, the script often becomes for men that you're just, you're just mm -hmm. what you can't help it. You know, you, it, yeah. you see this, you're put in this situation. Um, this comes on to your computer screen or so-and-so is interacting with you this way, or she was wearing X. It's your programming to do this. Um, and I think from a Christian perspective, we want to say, no, actually, um, we as humans can transcend and qualify, uh, those urges in ways that are dignifying to ourselves and to others. Um, and, uh, I'm tempted to say more about the way the, uh, empowerment of the spirit works in doing that but i've talked i've talked enough so maybe yeah no i appreciate that because i think that that is a i mean yeah and i think you know one of the choices i think we have the freedom to make is the choice to reflect on our own behavior right yes and so uh to sort of to, so we do have i mean of course this this podcast is called the embodied faith podcast so we definitely believe that embodiment is part of being human but we also have the unique opportunity to step outside of our bodies every once in a while and notice and right. reflect yeah. and go, huh, this behavior doesn't seem to be in line with the kingdom of God. What's going on here? Um, and Jeff and I just did a podcast the other day about like getting down to the bottom of your desire. What is it that you really want? Mm -hmm. What is it that you're really after? Um, and so that that sort of ability to reflect on our own behavior is also something that makes us, I think, uniquely human. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I appreciate everything you're saying that there is this beauty of I mean Jesus is fully human, fully man, fully embodied and fully God and we are the same, you know, so have that same dynamic. To, so, to kind of Yeah. Not to say that we are God. I just want to clarify that, but that we are <laughs> empowered by God. So kind of turn turn the corner a little bit from like what is toxic masculinity? What what then is like non-toxic masculinity to sum up at the end of the book, you kind of, you, you talk about, um, kind of the broad from just like the, the physical embodied sexuality of like growing from boyhood to manhood, you know, being married, you know, the sex and how that functions. And, uh, and that's all really great. But at the, the end, you kind of make this turn, I think is a little broader and you talk about like the goal of masculinity, uh, and you connect that with fatherhood. But you mean that broader than just, you know, mm -hmm. having biological children. So could you talk a little bit uh, about yeah. that? Um, yeah. Um, first of all, I are you a father? Am okay. I am. Yeah. I have three, three right, young excellent. children. You're, you oh, this is a busy time. Oh, six, four, and I did doctoral one, work so at that same age. Actually, not, not one. So six, six and four yeah. is about when I, so Lord bless Well, you. yeah. Our ah, third okay. is our, our bonus baby. We Surprise. had no, we had no, um, intention of, yeah, of um, moving to England and adding to the ranks. Uh, but all right. But, so back to the good. question. Um, and she, and she's, and she's, and she's great and, uh, mercifully oh, okay. are our easiest in many ways. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so in that chapter, what I'm trying to, the question I'm trying to ask and then, and then, you know, offer a potential answer is what is our sexuality? You know, if our sexuality isn't the sum total of what it means to be human, but it is a very integral and even core part of our human identity. So the question I wanted to ask is, what is that part of our humanity for? Um, and my answer is in a reference to, to the Reformed Catechism, is that the chief end of male sexuality is fatherhood or fatherhood is the chief end or the mm -hmm. end goal or the telos of male sexuality. And another way of saying that is the reason God made us sexual is so that we might become fathers and mothers. Um, and that need not express itself narrowly in the literal biological fathering of children. But even if it doesn't, I think there is something built into our embodied maleness as men that signals a goal of our humanity being a fatherly or paternal orientation mm -hmm. towards others in the world. 
And this is a way of describing how we might move with a cultivating, creative, nurturing, rearing, protective, provisional disposition, all these types of things that we might associate with fatherhood, and many of which we might also associate with mm -hmm. motherhood, by the way, um, towards the world. So I, I think... If we get a little creative, and a lot of times this is some of the most life-giving and interesting theologizing to do is when you're kind of thinking creatively about what is this part of myself for, um, there are all types of arenas that I think our fatherly telos of our sexuality can find expression, um, both in friendships or professional settings or um, endeavors in the world, uh, be it in your home or artistically, you know, I have a section in the book where I go through a whole list and I, a couple of people have said like, is this fatherhood is just everything. Like you're kind of just connecting it to mm -hmm. too many places. Um, but that's kind of, that's kind of the point I want to make. Um, and another reason for creating this broad definition of the fatherly call, uh, implicit in male embodiment is because, of course, not all men are currently or will become fathers or or even become married or be in, you know, long term partnered sexual relationship uh, like that. The um, and uh, in scripture, of, of course, uh, the Apostle Paul was single and so was right. the Lord Jesus himself. So if we have a, a kind of script of masculinity that needs to be narrowly defined around eroticism and the literal fathering of children, um, we've excluded the incarnate son of God from that script. And uh, I think that should give us some pause and um, does not seem to be the case in my view that Jesus, because he was married or, you know, not a literal father, did not have a fatherly disposition or did not live mm -hmm. into a fatherly calling in the world. Nor is it the case that his sexual part of himself, his sexual humanity, was just kind of incidental or put on the shelf and like, okay, well, that's not for me. I'm my, like, if that were the case, you know, th there's no asexual Jesus. There's no asexual human being. Uh, he became incarnate as a, as a sexual mm -hmm. person, just like there. So much more we could unpack about that. How is it that a male savior is a savior for all? sexes so that's uh for another Absolutely, podcast yeah. uh so do you have any yeah can sure. i can i just give one note on that because uh my friend amy peeler has written recently written a book called women and the gender of god that is a i it academic but i think accessibly so um uh wrestling with this question and she does some really great and insightful work there um connecting that with uh Mary, the mother of Jesus, and all sorts of things like that. So I, that's just a quick plug there. Um, and she she's will on have, my uh, list. More sophisticated to answers get there on the podcast. So. Yeah, there you go. So, For yeah, sure. Amy Peeler, women. Well, there's the so much more, uh, obviously, that we could uh, say about this. Again, uh, we've been talking about the book, the Non Toxic Masculinity: Recovering Healthy Male Sexuality. And again, it's it's focused primarily on like those sexual issues and questions coming out of the sexual revolution, as well as purity culture in the 90s and early uh, 2000s uh, in the evangelical movement and just how that has shaped and or misshapen uh, how we think about sex and sexuality um, and how that then you know creates some of these kind of issues lots of other topics could be talked about even as we do this you know um, I'm always like oh we could do a whole series on all this stuff but and maybe we will but thank you so much for stopping by where can people find you online or the work that you are doing yeah, um, I have a personal website, ZacharyCWagner.com. Um, uh, Zachary is spelled Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y-C-W-A-G-N-E-R.com. Um, you can, it, that's like everybody's personal website. Oh, it man, is long overdue too. for an update. <laughs> um, so, so I, for instance, we'll have to update it to put interviews like this and others on there and different speaking events and things that I have going on, but yeah. that's the intent. Um, same Zachary C. Wagner. You can find me on Twitter and uh, Instagram. 
Um, I'm not super, super active on those places because and you have PhDs three small children. Done. <laughs> um, so you're correct. Yeah. Um, so lots of reading and other things that need to happen, but I do uh, poke around, uh, particularly on Twitter from time to time. Um, are, are we're, we're supposed don't. to say X now, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. that's well, where thank people you so can much find for me. being on and bless your studies and your all aspects of your fatherhood and fathering. Yeah. Thank you yeah, so much for having today. me. Blessings.